Radio Retro Future has been made possible by the Groene Vee Absinthe. Some of the best artisanal absinthe from the Netherlands. You can find their selections of homemade absinthe, both white and green, on the groenevee.nl backslash en. Or click the link down in the description. I'm also doing a, a little experiment where I'm going live on Facebook to see if that will draw more viewers. Um, so yeah, curious to how that will go. Maybe more people will comment that way as well. So that would be nice. Um, can I... Do whatever you want. Yes. Okay. Well, I will. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I suggest we're, <laughs> I suggest we're just gonna gonna start the show here in Radio Retro Future. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bonsert, and today I'm here with Eric Fisk to talk a little bit about Diesel Punk, um, based on a video I made uh, recently called "A Question for Diesel Punks." So if you want to watch that video, I'll put it down in the description. Um, how are you doing, Eric? Well, I'm okay as long as I, I I don't exit out of the wrong window here by accident. By the way, total full disclosure: this is also a future episode of the Fedora Chronicles Radio Show, which you can find on my website, thefedorachronicles.com, and um, you can also find us on SoundCloud. Just do a search for Fedora Chronicles or Fedora Chronicle. Drop off the S because some platforms just letters you can use. But anyway, two things: first and foremost, Bonzart and I wanted to do a a monthly podcast for a while now just talking about the issues that's that steampunks and diesel punks share but because of a, a second job that i picked up we couldn't actually do this on a regular basis so one of the things i've done is that i've i've, I've moved things around i've moved some pieces on my life's chessboard and now i'm able to commit to this on a full-time basis so hopefully bonsart and i will be able to do this more on a regular basis and include other people from the, the diesel punk community. All right. And, the, and we, and we had this idea, we were going to talk about ethics and how, and whether or not steampunks and diesel punks and all retro punks well, for ethics in the everyday real world. And I'm not sure if whether or not we'll get to that or not, because the, what you brought up is such a, a, a big topic oh, that yeah. I think a lot of us need to bring up and, and address and they're, they're good topics. I think that what you had said in your video, a lot of questions, and a lot of which I'm I'm not going to answer for the entire diesel punk community because no, I think no. that that would be irresponsible on my part to do that. No, of course not. Yeah. Um, let me see if if I can. I'm gonna I'm gonna call up my my document here. <laughs> and the thing is, is that I I think I think that you asked. Well, I'm gonna count real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, cool. I, I I didn't keep count. I must admit, I I, I did it partly. I, I wrote the script and partly I did it on the top of my head uh, to formulate that question uh, because, like I said, it's a, it's a big topic. Like I basically asked, what is diesel punk, right? Uh, I, right. I made a, a hour-long documentary at this point on, on what, what, what right. steampunk is, so it was not the, the point, so the, the core of what, I, what I'm trying, and it's something that is bothering me about, you know, first off, there, there seems to be this, this idea that there is a dichotomy between steampunk and dieselpunk, at least that's right. how people tend to talk about it, I don't think... This is the case. I know you don't think that is the case. I mean, you you talked about uh, you wrote about wrote this blog. We talked about like the, the death. Of, uh, what was it called again? The death of steampunk. I, I wrote up here for a second. 2017. I wrote um, a rant on the Fedora Chronicles and I published it on many different steampunk platforms or 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 groups out there. People had responded to this. And the people who responded to this came in three flavors. They didn't read. They responded to what they didn't read, and they totally misunderstood what I was trying to say without actually reading it. Then you have the other group of people who totally agreed with what it is that I actually said and said, yeah, man, that's something we need to fix. 
-hmm. And then there are other people completely, totally misappropriated what I said and passed off what I had said on their own, their own thoughts as their own thoughts or ideas. Or this per th these other people and I are tuned into the same frequency and we made the same observation at the same exact time happenstance. Mm -hmm. I, there's nothing I can say about the first group. You didn't read it. You didn't understand it. You're angry. You have no idea why you're angry, other than the fact that you're just looking for somebody to be angry. And, and <laughs> well, they basically happy. they basically read the title and assumed that that, that was all it was about. <laughs> and then it was just like you know, and they're like, steampunk's not dead. And it, and they published all of these pictures. Sci uh, the only what did I call it? Cogsplay. John Pica from the Diesel Punk podcast mm -hmm. had coined the phrase. It's not it's not steampunk. It, it's cogs play. Okay. Because the thing is, is that there's there's no punk element to it at all. Steampunks have lost their anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment angst, or they never had it to begin with. And and the movement, mm -hmm. you have to be a punk. You have to be anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian. And when I see steampunks holding up with with these. Um, giants of steampunk and then they say well steampunk so it's not steampunk he says it's not steampunk so it's and, and you put forth these steampunk gods and goddesses who are the arbitrators of what is or isn't steampunk it's you're not you're not you're not punk anymore you have appointed or you have allowed somebody to self-appoint themselves figures you've established them as your establishment as your your authoritarians lost your punk angst mm -hmm. what steampunk ought to be i'm not the one who should be telling you this what steampunk should be is the anti-establishment anti-authoritarian movement against the culture as it exists now you, so the thing is that it was like steampunk should be a, a movement against this modern dichotomy or this paradigm telling you that this is exactly how you dress this is how people dress in the 21st century and it's, and it's garbage it's not it's it take take the crappiest elements of the 60s and 70s that the salvation army put in a dumpster somewhere because nobody was buying into it anymore and recycle that and pass that off as fashion for the 21st century I'm, i want no part of it it's awful and it's ugly is nope. that you're supposed well, yeah, it's clear. not comfortable as far as I'm concerned, but um, but yeah, let's uh, let's get back on topic. On uh... <laughs> so, but, that's, but the thing is, is that when you talk about the death of, of of steampunk, and so many people say steampunk is not dead. No, you 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 you've lost your and you've lost your mojo, as it were. I think you people got to get it back for diesel pumps, but that's that's a topic for later on in the show. Mm -hmm. But yes, if I say that steampunk is on the way out, I do think steampunk is on the way out and it's being replaced by um, Victorian sci-fi fantasy wear, or Pika has called it. And then another question you asked is, um, uh, which of all these retro punks? And, uh, and, I, and I, I'll make the, the argument, I think, it's, I, think, I think diesel punk has already outlasted because this has been a movement trying to pull the the style and substance back to the jazz era and there are so many people out there whether you call them dandies or 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 flappers or, or whatever we you know the neo swing movement mm -hmm. of, of diesel punk because that's exactly what it is it's trying to re-establish the style aesthetic of the jazz era right so you're 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 comparing it very much to chaps as well period i th i think i think that chaps are who are trying to dress as if it is the 1930s, 40s again? I think I think that chaps, uh, I think that they're diesel punks, and, and they may not know it. May, maybe they don't like being called diesel punks. But the thing is, is that my view of diesel punks is all inclusive. Radio Retro Future has been made possible by the Groene Vee Absinthe, some of the best artisanal absinthe from the Netherlands. You can find their selections of homemade absinthe, both white and green, on thegroenevee.nl backslash en, or click the link down in the description. To reintroduce the style and substance, well, this, there's no, I don't think there was any real substance 
back then. I think that they had just the same amount of problems as we did back then, and they, they didn't address them the way we have. If you want to bring back the jazz era aesthetic, and you want to call yourself a diesel punk, you should call yourself a diesel punk. Big tent approach to, to, to the issue of, of diesel punk. Yeah, it, it, but that's the, the, the one of the things I I, I I see is like you 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 really bunker down on that Americana. Which yes, you, yes. Okay. That's the one aspect of diesel punk I I don't like. I don't think that it should be purely Americana. I do think that we should be also embracing zero aesthetic of everywhere um especially europe with well the with the exception of that that little aryan nation there on in in the middle off to this off to the, the right but i mean the style aesthetic um it, from the 20s and 30s and 40s i think is beautiful and i wish it still existed today mm -hmm. and the way that the the way the rest of Europe dressed during the jazz era is something that I wish that we could bring back today. Yeah, that, that, you know, that's that's a bit of the thing, though. I don't, uh, at least in the Netherlands, we're not nostalgic for that era. Right. Um, that that's the thing. That's why I, I said that um, uh, you, you'll probably never have a, a big diesel punk movement. In Europe, like like I said, the 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 the, the, the steampunks are using the aesthetic more and more. Um, currently playing, there are billions of them. Great uh, RTS game, um, and yeah, it it, it it uses a well, it, it is steampunk, but uh, it calls itself steampunk as well. But you see, there are the diesel punk influences there, and I think you you will see that more and more uh, with Steam makers doing that. Um, but it still is like like I said I, I, I talked a lot about the platform and I think there that's the core that that platform right there um, that will always remain um, grounded in, in uh, 19th century science fiction um, yeah. I, I think that that's that's the thing and I, I think uh, one fun thing I um, what noticed with with all the the writers I interviewed on, on steampunk is they always use localized history they always use like the, the, the city where they're from or where they live or uh, the country where they live and and they they kind of punk that they kind of immerse themselves in that history and and use that as inspiration for for character stories and, and certain plot developments um, so when you you look at what diesel punk uh, does, it's 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 just that, except that they, like we just talked about, really focus on that American piece of history that that the the twenties to fifties period. So uh, that's that's an observation I made. Not not sure what to make of it, but it's it's there's this this really important connection with with both history especially local history um so yeah i think that diesel punk can become a strong movement uh yeah. in yeah. uh in the united states i don't think it will be that in in europe and, and outside that uh, what i do f in that regard it's really interesting to see how developing this steampunk is in, in countries like uh, like I've got 10% of my viewers are from Taiwan for some reason mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting uh, I had a talk with uh, an Indonesian student that now lives in Taiwan uh, on uh, yeah well colonial history uh, interesting discussion for the people that uh, want to watch that on how they look at uh, well Dutch colonialism in his case um, so yeah, that's, that was a really surprising interview. Um, and yeah, we, well, we see Steampunk in, in South America, in, in South Africa. It seems to be really popular for some reason. Um, so that's, that, that's something I, I wonder uh, what, what the connection is there. Oh, I will tell you. Okay. I will, I will tell you from my perspective and my point of view. 
and it harkens back to something that I, I've said earlier. The, the fashion and the style yep. mm -hmm. during the Victorian and those decades the, the entire aesthetic of, of, of steampunk is beautiful and the entire jazz era aesthetic is also beautiful every there's something happened and I'm trying to figure out when is the exact cutoff but the thing is has happened to every aspect of Western culture sometime it's, some people want to blame the death of Kennedy and I'm thinking okay but it happened it happened in the mid 60s mm -hmm. every every aspect of style and fashion was ugly and it's it's ugly now it is there's something about the style aesthetic from the, the from the from the late to the late to mid 60s throughout the 70s with very rare exception it is it is it reveals sort of like a cynicism marketeering and advertising whereas it doesn't matter how ugly it is it doesn't matter how go gauche it is which is a word i hate to use it doesn't matter Blissfully ugly it is. Idiots will still buy it. The style and fashion industries during those decades, even to the 80s to an extent, it was a game to see how ugly they can make things and see if people would still buy it. And and for from my perspective, diesel punk and steampunk, the entire retro punk movement, centric movement, has been born out of the disgust we have towards modern society that is the cynical everything is a throwaway society if it's ugly you'll buy it because we make it and here in the United States we had an automaker who had uh, a, a philosophy inside the boardroom that said listen we are American made no matter what we make they will buy it and they made junky cars cars that actually killed people cars that actually exploded when rear-ended like the ford pinto in 1976 which was which was classic and the thing is is that people used it when the retrocentric movement began it was i don't even remember it was just called vintage or 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 retro or whatever it was called people would actually go buy old things and repurpose them because they were built to last. The crap that they got away with during the 60s and 70s, you could not get away with generations earlier because angry customers would hang you. I mean, literally and metaphorically. And the thing is, is that, look, there's a, there's a reason why diesel punks and steampunks exist. There's a reason why. It's because it's... The aesthetics is better. You look at a frock coat that was made during the Victorian or Edwardian period. It's beautiful, it's well cut, it's well made, better than a lot of stuff that's out there now. I, I kind of wonder um, if the sexual revolution had anything to do with that. that. That was also somewhere around the 60s, right? Yeah, and the thing is, is, is that um, I, I think that it would, it would be hard for you to figure, to point to a causality sexual revolution had something to do with it i think the drug culture more than anything else i think that what i think that what madison avenue and the rest of the um the advertisers wanted to do was they wanted to make everything into L lsd um acid trip everything needed to look like an acid trip yeah it's, you're it, talking about uh, the hippie culture now right yeah the hippie culture and the thing is that the hippie culture spilled into every aspect of American culture, mm -hmm. aspect of the hippie culture that wanted to burn all of the jazz era um, aesthetics, old cut suits, trimmed hair, fedoras, um, and you know, and and the hat industry was decimated during the '60s because of. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a bit of, of uh, anti-authoritarianism, what you talked cool. about. I mean, 
uh, they, they rebelled against the status quo, and, you know, the fedora at that time was one of those symbols, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that makes sense from that perspective. And, uh, basically, basically, what you're suggesting is now we're going full circle. Now the fedora is the the uh, <laughs> the, the the mark of resistance, so to speak. I I think well, no, because the thing is, is that the fedora was also worn by um, bootleggers and mobsters, who were the original anti-authoritarian figures in the in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Be, you know, because of the Volstead Act and prohibition, and the rebellion of that. Um, you know, the anti-authoritarian movement, you know, during Prohibition is, you know, it's it's a look that really sort of caught on. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure why the hippies didn't embrace that. But, you know. Well, they were more inspired by uh, the, their perception of Indian culture. Sure. So, sure. yeah, ban bandanas and then the head and, you know, all that youth crap, I suppose. So yeah, yeah, it was the the, the, the shapeless uh, yeah, it was the introduction of the shapeless T-shirts that are now commonplace. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. I mean, I look, I I don't look. I'm wearing a T-shirt right now, but I'm also wearing a shirt over it. So mm -hmm. I mean, there's a time and a place for everything. Oh yeah, yeah. But anyway, I, I, I only wear uh, wear shirts like uh, the ones I'm wearing right now. Um, I, I just not comfortable with ordinary t-shirts. Otherwise, I wore polos, but I wear those well, only when it's really hot. Well, here's an, here's another another thing that you had brought up in your video, and mm -hmm. I and I also, like I said, I took notes. And another thing that you had mentioned is is that well, wh why do diesel punks claim everything that we like and name it diesel punks? Well, some do, uh, not all, of course. Well, I, I I think that very I think that I have a lot to blame for that because I had the last couple of years that we should have a a a big tent approach to diesel punk to apply mm -hmm. the world the that jazz era aesthetic to their daily lives they they should be allowed to call themselves diesel punk a lot of people have fought me on that and as far as I'm concerned I look I won that fight. Because the thing is, is that if you embrace everybody and say everybody is welcome, if you want the jazz era aesthetic in your daily life, that's okay. You can be a diesel punk. And a lot of people, are, a lot of people wanted to turn diesel punk into their own, their own kingdom, their own fiefdom. They wanted to, they wanted to trademark it and they wanted to, to, to put their own label on it. They wanted to make their large corporate dollar they wanted mm -hmm. to turn it into their personal private No, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, and well, we, the, and here, a lot of us. Uh, but, but my my thing is, and the, the, the same bothers me about about steamboats who've been doing this. Um, well, first of all, there's there's the practical problem is when you call everything diesel punk uh, that you like, um, it, it sends a very confusing message to well, okay. th that's that's the problem in communicating right yes. that, uh, yes. that i mentioned um okay. the, the second of all is uh, when you look at it from the other perspective um is like for example a lot of people call wild wild west steampunk okay you, you, you know where that actually comes from what genre no tell me weird west Steampunk completely appropriated Weird West. No one talks about Weird West anymore, except some rare cases, maybe cowboys versus aliens. Um, but, you know, that that's the thing. Um, and, and maybe, I don't know, I, I don't know how popular Weird West was uh, at the time. Uh, maybe it was never that popular to begin with, so when, when Steampunk took it over, you know, may, maybe it was for the best. But... Uh, the, the thing is, like, I, I believe that you gotta have to allow things to be their own thing, right? I mean, there are a lot of people that take the inspiration from the same sources as you do, but have no sure. intention to be diesel punk or to be steampunk or to be anything. Like, I, I, I intentionally don't try to look steampunk. Also, I don't really like the neo-Victorian thing, but 
I, I want to do my own thing. And I ass so that, and my inspiration to do that stems from steampunk. I, I consider steampunk to be a kind of a, this, this, this really metaphysical concept that inspires a platform of people to, um, you know, spread their ideas. So that that platform, that, that that community is so central to what what makes steampunk steampunk. Um, well, but you me, got the me, oh yeah, go ahead. Push up and 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 I don't want to forget my point. That's all. Okay. Yeah, but uh, to 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 finish off, it's like you, you got to accept that. I got to accept. Everyone has to accept that we don't have a monopoly on a certain aesthetic. So, you know, please incorporate everything you want in Dieselpunk. That's that's not my point. If you you, you, you like something, please incorporate it in what you do. Um, but also accept that, you know, allow people to have their own thing. Don't try to appropriate that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm well, very concerned about. Well, I, I think that, and, and this is a problem, and I'm not sure if I have a decent solution for this. I'm not. I'm the first person to admit that it's a problem, and I'm not sure how to address it yet. But the thing is, is that it's from my perspective here in New England, is that steampunk is a large umbrella. Mm -hmm. Diesel punk is a large umbrella, and and underneath this umbrella, or if you can imagine a Venn diagram, you have a big, huge circle called steampunk and within that circle you have medium-sized circles like weird west the people who make steampunk products especially clothes are able to market to more people to more people who are interested in that style aesthetic and then there are people who are into just um weird west accessories their, make their look more Western steampunk, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, there's and I and I and I grab this magazine here, and it's sitting it's sitting here next to me. And I was flipping through it, and it, it has Jeff Bridges on the cover. And the magazine is called Cowboys and Indians. And it's it's GQ for the Western set. Through it, and I said a lot of this stuff could be appropriated by people who are steampunks if you're oh, into yeah. the west a lot of the great stuff that they sell in the in this magazine a lot of the advertisers i know that a lot of steampunks would like this now the thing is is that is it western or is it steampunk or is it a combination of the two well i think the, 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 the thing is, and I, I think that goes for, for both Dieselpunk and Steampunk, is that it's all about uh, immersion, right? It's all about, uh, I mean, uh, some, uh, I, I want to, to make a video on this on someone who made a, a great um, article on, you know, what is cyberpunk, what is steampunk, what are these, these punk genres? And um, I already came to the conclusion that he drew, but uh, he, he just worded it better, like, that, that cyberpunk, steampunk, dieselpunk, it's all about world building. All about world building. Like, uh, for example, 1984. No one talks about the characters of 1984. Everybody talks about the world and all its ramifications. That's... And... Right, now, in, in the discussions I have, people always talk about, you know, oh, this is like, this is like 1984, right? And... Yes. I, I consider uh, 1984, I don't consider it steampunk or dieselpunk, but I do think it's a very important book that would, but that would set the standard for what would finally become cyberpunk and so on. Um, and you, you may disagree, uh, disagree or, <laughs> or agree with me on that, that's not the point. But uh, here's the problem. Okay. Here's the problem for a lot of people. Okay, you and I can both disagree about 1984's aesthetics but we can both agree on the overall message and the thing is is that you and I can disagree on certain aspects it's your big message and still remain friends I don't understand why people have to part company because you don't agree that diesel punk is you know 1984 is diesel punk 
can, but go on. Yeah, well, I wasn't talking about the aesthetics of the book. I was talking purely about the world building. And yes. uh, I, I think when, when, when people introduce their, their steampunk work to you, they'll talk about the world. And maybe they'll talk about the characters, but mostly they'll talk about the world. Like, yeah, this is what makes my world unique. In fantasy, you, you see the same thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, fantasy is a, is, a, is a difficult genre uh, in that regard. But yeah, it, it, for me, like, like when going to a steampunk event, that's, that's why I don't like normal conventions where, where you see a lot of cosplayers. There's no immersion in cosplay events, so to speak. Um, when I go to a, a steampunk convention, I expect to become immersed in, in what's going on in, in, in the audience, in, 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 in the visitors, in, in, you know, everything that's there. And I think that's, for me, that, that's, that's the punk element, that, that immersion to, to get away. Uh, from to have a little break of reality, so to speak. Um, I, I thought that was a very astute observation of the, the writer. I, I don't have his article uh, at this point, but I, I have it somewhere. Well, when you find the link, send it to me. Yeah. Uh, I want to go through the rest of this li this list here and uh, kind of like address a couple of uh, issues that you made here. Um, another thing is, is that um, diesel punks tend to uh, call anything that's alt history from the 20s, 30s, and 40s as diesel punk. Uh, like uh, uh, Man in the High Castle. I, I use Man in the High Castle as an example of something they call diesel punk. I don't think I went as far as what you just described, but fine. Okay. I mean, the th well, these are, these are just the notes. Um, but the thing is, is, is that I think that. No, I think you, you did kind of say, and maybe this is the way I took it, that that we as diesel punks. Uh, I I, used, I saw somebody call it diesel punk. That's what I reacted okay. to. So it was an observation. Like I said, these were sim simply observations. Like I, I saw somebody calling Glorious Bossers diesel punks and and, and the men in high calls diesel punk. So yeah, and that that's once again that 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 communicating, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, you know, yes, we, we we do do that. I'm not saying you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that yes, we, we if if it we do consider all alt history about the 20s, 30s, and 40s as diesel punk. You think that yes, it is overreaching. But the thing is, is that again, it gets back to that big tent approach to diesel punk that we would like everybody who wants to call themselves diesel punk diesel punk and if you want to call something like inglorious bastards diesel punk then please by all means do so it's not because we're trying to steal it and claim it for our own we're trying to from my perspective we're just trying to be more inclusive yeah but you're you you say that but you're you're taking something i i do does the the artist of that that product want to be called diesel punk that that's my concern like you're saying oh that, that's diesel punk and you sure take your inspiration from it that's not my issue uh it's like like i said like uh the, well i don't take the the producer of the weird weird uh, wild wild west uh, movie very seriously in that regard i don't think he, he gives a damn but um you know when when um how uh what, what's a good example when, when you've got a, a, a steampunk artist that, that really considers what he does steampunk and he makes something diesel punks like and all of a sudden everybody starts calling him diesel punk uh, do you think that that's very respectful to the artist uh that that's my point yes uh, I do agree with because the thing is is that if a, let me let me rephrase what you just said so I can better understand what it is that I think that you said. If somebody who is classically steampunk artist mm -hmm. one piece of work, it's obviously diesel punk. I don't think no that no we... he he made something that looks diesel, that happened though. What I said is something that diesel punks happen to like. That's what I said. Very important difference. I think that we can retroactively call everything somebody does diesel punk if it's obviously steampunk. 
Um, don't I don't think that we should do that. Um, do we do it? I think that yeah. I I think that some of us do. Is it right? Not really. I I mean. It, but I, I don't think it's a. It, I don't think it's it's doing it in a rude way. I don't think that we're trying to, you know, assimilate the. No, world. no, I, I agree with you on that. But you know, that that's kind of my point. Like, it, I don't say it's 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 malicious or anything like that. But it's. No, but we when we do it, it we're we're clearly in the wrong. When 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 some of us do that, I I agree with you. Yeah. So that yeah that that's kind of my point. And yeah, well, we agree on that, so I guess we can move yeah. to the next topic. Um, uh, so yeah, um, and I, I don't want to make it too long tonight, so let, let's talk a little bit about the, the ethics. Uh, or was there something else in, uh, in the video you really want to discuss? <laughs> Otherwise, we can keep focusing on that and we'll save the, the ethics discussion for next time. I mean, look, I mean, I'm more than, look, I mean, we're, we're, the way that I'm looking at it right now when I'm recording, this is only 36 minutes long so far. Mm -hmm. there, right. are, there, there are, let me just rattle off a couple of here and stop me um, if, if I if I cross the line and go overboard. Okay. Rocket, Rocketeer, Wolfenstein, especially Wolfenstein, and Hellboy are, are all, they have de elements of that fellow diesel punks um, will claim it entirely diesel punk or just parts of a diesel punk. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all beholder. Yeah. Uh, I and, and again, I do think that you're right that diesel punks tend to be a little too Ameri Americo centric, as it were. And if it's if I just coined a phrase, I'm sorry, but it is it is a lot of it is um, centered towards American. This, uh, a style um, jazz era art deco. Sorry, and you're you're right. I'm sorry. Now, what sets diesel punk apart from all the other, um, and, uh, all the other retro punks? And this is a part that makes me really sad. Something that I think that we should all address. I can easily integrate uh, the nineteen style aesthetic into my everyday life within reason it's very easy it's not so easy for steampunks who want to incorporate the victorian and the edwardian periods of style and fashion into their everyday life i think that's unfortunate when i after i wrote requiem for steampunk yeah, somebody had nice. said well it's easy for you want because uh, a suit made in the 1930s and 40s can very easily uh, slide under the radar and be accepted. You can't wear uh, a Victorian outfit business every day. Mm -hmm. You can't even do it on casual Fridays, even. <laughs> and I, th and I, think that, I think that that's a rule that needs to be broken. I think that, hey, yeah. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. I think that... that Steampunks should be able to dress steampunk every single day. And this is a part of my other thesis. We do not live in a free society. We do not live in a free society. Understood me, let me rephrase that. We do not live in a free society. If we did, you would be able to dress in Victorian style clothes and on Halloween. You should be able to. And we are, we are told, people in our society, even our peers, what we can and cannot wear. And I, and I think that's wrong. And I'm sorry, you will not see me in a sports jersey rooting for my favorite <laughs> team. Because I, I, that's not my style. That might right. be your style. Punk, I'll coin that phrase right now. Yeah. You can, well, you then... Just today, I uh, read a f post on Facebook of somebody I know uh, from Belgium that wrote an angry rant that uh, he's uh, looking for a job right now. And he got a response from, I think it was a cinema, that uh, clearly stated that he was rejected because they were looking for run-of-the-mill people. <laughs> okay, you're a loss. Yeah, it's quite incredible. 
and I, I guess I, I really have to be really fortunate that I can dress the way I do to work, I suppose. I, I but think maybe that that's I, a Dutch thing. I don't know. I, I think that the, I think that the world would be better off. You seem to think that we should all be run of the mill. I think the people who who advocate run of the mill, I, I think that I think that they should be shunned and embarrassed for thinking the way that they do. And is that the punk in me? Yeah, that's the punk in me. Maybe. Yeah. If you want to shame somebody for being different, whatever it is, I, you're that person. It, it, those people who want to shame people who want to be different, those are the people who should be shamed and sent off to an island somewhere to live. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does come across like discrimination, doesn't it? No, it's not like discrimination. It is discrimination. Because the same person who will bully somebody for dressing like a nerd does not want somebody in their employee to dress like dress steampunk or diesel punk. You know secretly they also have bigoted thoughts towards people um, of, of different colors, different ethnicities, different religions, different sexual orientation. And I found that to be true every single time. If you're anti-steampunk or anti-diesel punk, you're also anti-gay, anti-hateful religion of the month, whatever. Oh, if you if you despise people who do not dress the way you think they should dress, then secretly or openly, you're also a racist and a bigot. I have never ever in my life found it to be otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it is. Uh, I think the Dispunk community in that regard is is, is is a progressive community, for certain. Uh, I mean, it's it's known. Uh, like I, I talk to a lot of people uh, that are not. Um, identify with steampunk or diesel punk or anything like that um, but they are active as entertainers for example and they do um, you know acknowledge how inclusive the community is how the people are uh, how they always feel welcome and I, I think that's uh, how um, how steampunk got as big as it did because uh, and I think I think there's something that diesel punks can learn from, like they actually, you know, approached uh, the people, uh, you know, the, the normies, so to speak, in public places and engaged with them and told them what they do and invited them in and, um, you know, told their story, showed their stuff and, and, and drew people in, not just with, with the aesthetic, but also with the community itself. So. Once again, that's why I believe that that, that platform is so essential. Um, but yeah, go on. I know, because I, I, that, that's that's one of the things I've, I've tried to do with the Fedora Chronicles uh, since uh, 2004, mm -hmm. is to make sure that everybody who loves the aesthetic of that era, the jazz era, feel included. It wasn't until recently I said, I just, I just gave up and I said, well, I'm just going to call it a diesel pump pub publication. And, and and get on with the rest of my life instead of trying to do do it secretly and covertly. <laughs> um, well, what did you identify no, I, as I, before I, then? What did you just, call just retro? Okay, just retrocentric with with uh, the you know uh, retrocentric um, from from the jazz era. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy. I you know thing is is that listen. I I didn't want. Here here's the thing. I don't want to misappropriate diesel punk, and I'm a diesel punk. <laughs> um, and at the point, and I'm at the point now, whereas no, because the thing is, is that now we are at a uh, at a period of time, or I'm at a period of time that I want everybody who is into that style aesthetic to be included. I want them. I don't want them to feel like they're included. I want them to know they're included. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that steampunk does right that we haven't got caught up with. But the thing is, is that because we are so integrated with the society, with our way of dress, because it is, you can very easily dress um, 1930s and 40s jazz era aesthetic and still pass under the radar as, oh no, he's just a hip and with it guy. He's just stylish, you know. Yeah. You can dress diesel punk 
and still be regarded as stylish. I don't think that you can do that with steampunk yet. And I think that's this, I think society needs to wake up and realize that it's like, this is not a free society unless everybody's free. And I don't think steampunks are, are always free. No, that, I, well, the, the thing is, like, you're like, you're allowed by law to dress any way you want, you know, uh, if there is no excessive nudity involved. But, uh, um, yeah, people, co uh, people conform a lot. So I think that's right. I, I think that's 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 maybe the problem. The the, the social pressures prevent us from um, dressing the way we want. So yeah, you you gotta be be lucky to be in an environment where where such dress is accepted. But no, I think you have to make your, because if you're not in a in a environment that allows that, I think you have to make the environment. I think mm -hmm. that there are people within the diesel punk community, and I think that we should encourage them and help them out as best we can. Mm -hmm. And it gets back to my original thesis. And style is awful. Right. Most of it is awful. The only stuff that isn't awful is the stuff that is clearly, obviously, Edwardian, Victorian, jazz era. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. And, and the thing is, and there's a part of me that seems to think that we owe it to society. Get them off of, uh, uh, off the acid trip, as it were, with style and fashion. Um, and do your own thing. Now, the thing is, if you like the crap that's coming out of Gucci with uh, Alessandro Michele or whatever, the, whatever his, his name is, <laughs> who is salvaging through the dumpsters from the 1960s and 70s. If you like that, that's fine. That's great. Full. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me a little, it makes me a little queasy. I, I think it's ugly as all hell, but you should be allowed to wear that. But you should not tell me that's what I'll be wearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Asians who got there. on the... Uh, that got on that um, on that bandwagon um, this past spring with this cra with the with the with the crazy um, other, what was the other guy um, uh, Thomas Brown who had this line of all he did was put men in women's clothing now if you want to dress that way that's fine mm -hmm. don't tell me that that's what I'm going to be wearing next year because I won't and I think that that's, that's the problem that we have here, is that we have a society that thinks it's okay for everybody. I'm guilty of this. Hey, listen, I'm guilty of this in this podcast now. I, I, I believe more if more people should be dressed the way that, that, that we, were, we were dressed in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s with a jazz era aesthetic. That's why I do it, because I think the modern fashion is just ugly as hell. Mm -hmm. And I want to turn back the clock in only that era. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I just, you know, I lead by example, I suppose. And, and now I have friends that wear suspenders like me because I wore them and then they figure out by themselves, no, this actually is really comfortable. So there's, there's, there's a reason why suspenders were a thing for a while. Oh, well, I, I don't know. How long have they, when, when did they start with suspenders? I'm not even sure. I'm not sure either. Hmm. Well, the, but, the question that it, it brings up. Hmm. So here's a question: Do we have any any comments from from the listeners? Uh, well, there, there was one, but uh, apparently my my Facebook connection is really crap. So the only response is like, "Yeah, the connection is really crap." Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, there is one from NG Moore. Why not the goths do? Unfortunately, I'm not sure what she means with that. What, you mean uh, um, whether or not steampunk is nothing more than just goths and brown? Uh, why not the goths do? I don't, what, what do the goths do? That's my question. Here's the, here's the thing, whatever the goths do. See, here, and I think that the goths have a lot to teach us. I think that the I think goths have a great thing. Whereas, listen, 
this is how I'm. This is how I am dressed. Mm-hmm. This is how. This is who and what I am. It. You know, maybe. Hey. Will happen to you in the parking lot after work. Maybe you could get accidentally mugged. I don't know. I'm not saying we should threaten violence on the people who are trying to keep us down and put us back in their box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you more replied, uh, yeah, just wear what they want, basically. That's exact. I mean, the thing is, is that here's another example of why we live in a soft fascist state. We allow other people to tell us what we can and can't wear. We live in a soft fascist society. Example, we have magazines that dictate to us what's in and what's out. They have a style. There's one magazine in particular. I won't mention it. it I will not mention the name of the publication. I will mention that it was founded by Hugh Hefner, but you can make up your own. <laughs> and it had this own style, and it says in the style section what's in and what's out. And you're supposed to file. Oh, fedoras are out in 2018. I guess we're not going to wear them anymore. Mm-hmm. People adhere to that. Yes. And some there are some fashion there are some fashions that should should die um, a quick and painless death because they're ugly. But that's not for me to decide. That's not for me. I'm not. I should not tell you what you can and can't wear. That I'd like to see. I like to wear more of the jazz era aesthetic, and so do my fellow diesel punks. And here's the thing: I'm not going to tell you you can't wear your your sports paraphernalia if you, that's what you want to wear. That's your business, right? But the minute you're wearing your sports paraphernalia and you tell me I can't dress like a diesel punk, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's not not something I I am particularly. Uh, um... How do you say uh, concerned about? I must admit. Um, yeah, but maybe the Netherlands. I, I guess we have a very different culture um, from the uh, from uh, from the United States. I think that's that's a big difference. We've got so many ways of dress over here. It's it's hard to say. Well, that's that's typically Dutch. Sure, you've you've got the the the, the well class differences, so to speak, but. Uh, for, for no. some reason, I, I noticed among uh, certain colleagues, uh, the, the hipster look seems to be really in right now. Um, but yeah, that's still it's, it's hard to generalize for the Netherlands, I must say. Well, I but I but I, I will say, and I'm allowed to say this. I think there's a, there are aspects of the Netherlands that is far more advanced than we are mm-hmm. here in the United States. I think that the whole notion of, you know, land of the free, home of the brave is BS because there are some things we're not allowed to do that you're allowed to do in the Netherlands. If it, listen, if if I, if I want to go to my garden and pluck a weed out of my garden and smoke it, I should be allowed to do that. The idea that you're going to have um going to have the, the 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 fascist thought police or the fascist drug police come in with their combat boots and and their uniforms and their riot gear and their riot helmets with their walkie-talkies and stop me from smoking a weed that grows in my garden. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah, that's that, not, that that's an American problem, but yeah. You know. If if listen. That is not an example of how we live in a soft fascist state or a hard fascist state. Then obviously you're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. The idea that it was just like, look, I mean, one of your advertisers is for absinthe. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. you couldn't buy that here in the United States because it was it was illegal. It's it was illegal. Even that uh, whole reasoning is based on nonsense. But you no, know, whatever. Yeah. yeah, and the thing is, is that there are some things there are some things I cannot go out and buy. Quote, free unquote American. Mm-hmm crazy and the thing is this like there are certain i mean i i here's another thing i mean uh, as another example we are not allowed to have (laughs) uh, windmills to generate our own electricity if our neighbors find that our solar panels are ugly they have a voice in whether or not we 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 can have a solar farm in our backyard think about that Mm -hmm. 
Think about the absurdity of that. If I want, if I want my own solar farm, now listen, I'm I'm buying my solar panels. If I'm if I'm buying my solar panels, my a, a solar farm in my own backyard, and put electricity back on the grid, I should be allowed to do that. There, who are bought and paid for by um, the electric companies, who will not allow you to do that, or they are starting allowed to do that. But they are putting very strict restrictions on how much money you can make on the electricity you generate with your solar panels. Think about how ridiculous that is. I'm not I'm not sure what what the rules are uh, regarding uh, here over here. I mean, the the, the government is promoting um, solar panels for houses, um, but yeah, the, well, the, the Dutch have a very um, well, it's not so much legislation as it is tradition. Um, the, the, the Dutch and the Belgians are just very different um, compared to one another in that regard. Is that when it comes to infrastructure and how houses are built in the Netherlands, every, there are rules for everything. Um, but uh, the funny thing, uh, I once watched an American presentation about bicycle paths. Because if apparently, if American engineers want to learn how to make a bicycle path, they go to the Netherlands. Because in the yeah. Netherlands you can cycle everywhere. We don't have maps for bicycles. Because where a car can go, bicycles can go. Uh, it's, it's that simple. Uh, we don't wear bicycle helmets. Because we don't need them. We're safe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, of course, still a good idea to have a bicycle helmet, but you won't see me wear one. Um, but it, it, was, it was funny, one of the remarks, one of the, the, the people in the audience made was like, uh, the, the, the guy who gave the presentation went to the Netherlands two times, uh, with a three-year interval, I think it was. And so he went to a, a site where the bicycle paths were like this and then he returned three years later and then the whole thing had been changed and one of the things that that i thought was very funny was a question like they managed to do that in three years time yeah and that yeah i mean the dutch complain when, when something takes over a month you know um because we have I to cycle through it and drive through it but yeah a few months later it's there and yeah apparently a, yeah. for american standards that's extremely quick <laughs> so i i thought that was so, a funny but, funny thing but i will what i will say two things we are approaching an hour mm -hmm. we need to lose our connection is there any final thoughts you want to make before we we, we, we bring this to a close uh any final thoughts well we went horribly off topic during this episode <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there's that, but um, I, I think I had, uh, there, there seems to be some form of consensus among, well, at least the diesel punks that answered on my video, uh, that, yeah, that diesel punk seems to aim more to be like what, what the, the, the chaps in England. Um, so that's something I can, can put in a video in, in some form or another. Not sure how I'm gonna do that episode, I must admit, because I've got some other ideas for Steampunk Beginner's Guide episodes. But uh, they'll be useful to Diesel Punks as well, don't worry. Okay. Um, as always. I mean, have you have you watched the Diesel uh, the Steampunk Beginner's Guide? Some episodes? I do. I like, I, I, I like a lot of what it is that you've been saying, and I think that we can, we can, hey, listen, we're gonna appropriate a lot of that into Diesel Punk because we like it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, promote uh, promote uh, the Steampunk Beginner's Guide. Um, oh, something uh, maybe uh, your audience knows some people. Um, the uh, Radio Retro Future for Fallout 4 is coming out in a few days. Maybe tomorrow, kind of depends on the copyright uh, conflicts that are going on right now. Uh, Radio Retro Future for Fallout 4 is a gaming mod for the game Fallout 4. It's too long a story, but it's an apocalyptic world where there are radio stations. And I'm working together with Brandon Redding, who has made a gaming mod, a fan-made addition to the game that includes uh, over a dozen new radio stations where the players can listen to. And I've been making one for Steampunk. 
a steampunk-inspired radio station with its own story, so it's also an audio drama. Um, but I, uh, I want to include a little bit more uh, diesel-punk-inspired uh, inspired bands, if they exist. Um, so yeah, if you want to be part of the second season of Radio Retro Future for Fallout, uh, please contact me. Um, I'm sure Eric will include the link uh, to my contact information in uh, the description. So check that out. And of course, check out my YouTube channel, Radio Retro Future, where I have vlogs and the Steampunk Beginner's Guide and discussions and interviews. Yeah, so, I mean, as always, for the show page, send me your links. And I think that one of the things that I would like to, in, in my closing thoughts for all of this, is that... Okay, um, well, I uh, think uh, I'm done. I'm, I'm preparing for bed, because it's getting late That's over it? here. I need to get, ah. get off early in the morning. Uh, so, right. uh, yes, uh, my closing statement will be... I think we just lost you. Oh, really? Like, was our trans uh, transatlantic connection... Um, the modernists, the normals, are trying to stop us. Say uh, one more time. Yes, well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, make things your way. This is Eric Render King Fisk from the Fedora Chronicles radio show, signing off and reminding you, keep your chins up and your fedoras on. Thanks, Bonsart. I'll see you next time. Yes, will do. Five, six, seven, eight. Hit it! I 